Thank you all. So, um, uh, thank you, uh, Father Goff, for inviting me to do this. This is a great pleasure. Um, so, the title of this evening's talk, um, seeing to have a direct new mass for the ages, is very uh, general. I'm not an academic. I don't come up with titles for lectures very often. So, mm -hmm. forgive, I hope you forgive that. Um, so, um, it's not going to be specifically medieval. I know that a lot of this series has focused on um, scholarship um, in the church from the Middle Ages. And I'll, I'll touch a little bit on that, but this is more going to be talking about. Um, the Requiem Mass, uh, how it originated in chant form and then continued um, through really the whole canon of Western music. Um, uh, and that's including Mozart, that's including um, even the, the non liturgical Requiem, such as Verdi, and then into the 20th century with composers like Maurice de la Play. Um, I also want to just preface that I'm going to make, uh, I, I think that there are a lot of important um, uh, historical points to be made about. Uh, Different things that have happened in the culture since uh, since the Middle Ages, but particularly since the Renaissance onward, that I'm going to be very general about. So I might, you know, I'll touch on the Industrial Revolution for a moment, uh, and I'll make a claim that will be unnuanced, but it'll be it'll, I'll tie it into music in a way that I think will make sense. So uh, I just wanted to say that ahead of time. Um, Protestant Reformation, Industrial Revolution, uh, thing, things like that. So starting off before we get to anything. Historical, um, just the parts of the Requiem Mass. So the Requiem Mass, when they're um, uh, generally when it's been written, it's always been written um, uh, with the what is now called the traditional Latin Mass in mind. So that's the structure that is followed. So very similar to the New Mass in terms of uh, the order of worship or order of movements. Um, uh, and I've included things in here that you normally wouldn't see in uh, a concert Requiem or in a concert performance of a liturgical Requiem, but you would see in a Requiem Mass. Um, so the introit uh, requiem is turned on. Uh, one thing about the introit, um, uh, I, I think we, we, we sort of conceive of this incorrectly because we hear introit and we almost we hear introduction. And so that's why you see some places where they do the introit as a sort of prelude, whereas introit actually translates in Latin to he enters. And so it's supposed to be done during the procession. Um, so, so that's something that, of course, would have happened when, when these um, requiems were that mass. Then, of course, the Kyrie and Collect, the Epistle, the Gradual, which um, uh, translated that to the New Mass, it, uh, becomes the Responsorial Psalm. Uh, the Tract, which um, becomes the Alleluia, and is the Alleluia and the, and the Old Mass as well, but not in Lent or in um, whatever funeral masses are said or on the Feast of All Souls in particular. Um, so we'll get a little bit more into that as we continue on. The Sequence, now this is something that probably is most unfamiliar. Um, ever since the Council of Trent, we've only had uh, five sequences. The Council of Trent permitted four. Um, uh, and the sequences basically are, they're, they're, they're essentially just these poetic hymns that were written by any number of uh, uh, people. Most, most notably, it would have been uh, someone named Notker the Babbler, or Notker the Stammerer, uh, who wrote uh, the most famous one, and I don't know if this was a sequence that was done in the liturgy, but uh, he wrote the text in Media Vita, which is in the midst of life we are in death. That was written, written by Dr. the Babbler, and then subsequently set by composers like Henry Purcell and, and, and people like that who would have done things at, like the, the Queen of England's funeral and everything. So, um, but the sequence, there used to be hundreds of them. We used to do them most Sundays, and we used to do them on important feast days and everything. And, and Trent, a lot of what Trent did was kind of try and crack down on some of the liturgical craziness, for lack of a better word. Um, I sort of regret it in some ways. I like the tradition of the sequence, but now we are left, um, as I said, the Council of Trent committed four, which is the Victime Pascali Laudes, um, many, uh, many Sante Spiritus, so Victime Pascali is for Easter, the Easter, uh, uh, many Sante is for Pentecost, Laudes Ion is for Corpus Christi, um, and then they also committed um, the Aesire, which is for the Requiem. As a side note, um, the Stava Mater was committed at the Feast of a Lady of Sorrows, but that wasn't allowed again until the 18th century. So, um, the DSE rate, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a complicated one that we'll come back to um, further on in the presentation. Then the gospel would, re, would be read. Um, and then, the, uh, of course, you have Optory, Sanctus, I mean, stay in the end. The absolution, um, so this is this is something, and I'm trying to think in, in the new map, <coughs> it's final commendation, something like that. I'm looking to you, Father, for a reference here. Yeah, yeah. um, 
I've done, I think, three funerals at my time in the facility so far. So I'm more familiar with the old funeral than the new one. Um, so the Libra May is a text that would be sung um, just before the incensing of the casket um, or the catatalk. So this is another interesting thing. Um, oftentimes, uh, it's usually in the Feast of All Souls, you're commemorating All Souls, but you're not doing anyone's particular funeral. And so a catatalk, which is just this kind of wooden box uh, that's covered with um, um, some, some I don't know what the church, I don't know what kind of vestment it is, but um, uh, that is in a sense to kind of, uh, to signify all the souls that we are praying for at that mass. Um, and then as a recessional, the Imparadiso is sung. Um, and this I've seen that actually at the masses uh, decent enough. So, so that, those are the parts that recommend the mass. Um, and some notable differences between, uh, some, uh, between the Brechtian mass texts and the ones that we might be more familiar with. Um, so as I said, the use of the track instead of the Alleluia. Um, in the new mass, for some reason, in the funeral rites, an Alleluia is still sung at funerals, even if it's, unless of course it's been when, which I, I don't really know why that is, but that's, that's the way it is. So, so that's one thing, that's one thing to know. And the tract, a little bit more detail on that, the tract is sung um, in the Latin Mass, it's sung beginning of Septuagesim, which is three Sundays prior to Ash Wednesday, through the Easter Vigil. And that takes the place of the Alleluia. So just as in the New Mass, we, we sing, um, Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ, King of His glory, during Lent, and the Old Mass is the tract, which is sung. Um, there's no sequence in the, in the new rite of the Requiem, so that's something that's retained in the old rite, but it's not, it's not done. The new we do still retain, as a side note, we do still retain Easter Sunday, Pentecost, and Corpus Christi sequences. Um, you usually, you're allowed to do them either before or after the Alleluia. It would be more traditional to do it after the Alleluia, but usually I've always done it prior to the Alleluia just because it gets a little confusing. The Anu Day, this is interesting. So the Anu Day that's in the, the Requiem chant, uh, the Requiem Mass chant, you will recognize because it wants, it's one that still is sung um, in the Roman Missal today, um, but the words change in the, in the so, or in the old mass. So, uh, instead of Agnus Dei Cutonis Peccata Mundi, Miserere Nobis, we have Agnus Dei Cutonis Peccata Mundi, Dona in Miserere. So, man of God, who takes the sins of the world, grant them peace. Uh, and then the last one, instead of Dona in Pacem, it's Dona in Specium Sancti Terra. Um, and as I said, the Libra May and the Absolution uh, becomes the final commendation in the new right. Then it begins. So, types of mass settings, so this is getting more of this kind of the specifics of, of the music that we would see. Um, so, just to generally just lay out two terms that I'll be using throughout the talk. So, you have your chant mass settings, which um, generally that's it's monophonic, so that means it's one line. Um, you can think of it as congregational, not wouldn't necessarily have been sung by the congregation, but that's kind of the parallel that we have uh, in, our, in our day um, is that um, uh, what we say. A congregational mass setting, we're loosely referring to the same kind of thing, where it's one melody line that is sung by, by all, um, or it could just be sung by a soul, it doesn't, doesn't necessarily matter. Um, and then choral settings or polyphonic settings. So, polyphonic setting, of course, means uh, many voices as opposed to monophonic, which just means one. Um, and this is, so, this is two, uh, two or more independent lines of music. Um, that the note up there I have about the Middle Ages. Um, we really start to see, so the Middle Ages, everything, of course, was about, was, at least the music, musically speaking, uh, everything was about the number three because it was Trinitarian. And so, um, one of the, when you, when you get to the end of the 13th century, you start to see what's called the Ars Nova emerge in, um, uh, in the musical world. And so this is like pre, this is pre Guillaume de Five, pre Guillaume de Machot, kind of the pre early Renaissance composers. And the, the big scandal, scandalous experiment that they played was to, Divide things in two rather than in three. So, um, uh, so you had your perfect prolations, with a, which would have been a, a division by three, and an imperfect prolation, which, is, which would have been a division by two. Uh, and I'll explain more of that means a little bit later. So that leads into the, what, the, what the Cantus, what I mean by Cantus firmus mass or Cantus firmus motet. So um, that just means the use of a melody line, which is called as the tenor, which is called the tenor, which is used as the uh, harmonic and melodic foundation of the entire piece. So um, it was initially employed, uh, say initially employed, but it was often employed in a polytextual motets or macaronic motets, like the term I always like, I don't know where else you see that one. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so these, prior to the Council of Trent, these were very common. And so composers would take either a sacred or a secular song, often it was a secular song, 
and they would use the melody from that song as the harmonic and melodic basis for the whole mass. Now, it depends on the song, but for the most part, you know, like, so, for example, this, the only defies, Misa Se La Fa Se Pao, was Se La Fa Se Pao, and I know I'm butchering the French, but bear with me, was a song about a beautiful woman with a pale face, and he used that song as the basis for an entire mass of melody. He wasn't the only composer to do that. Another popular tune was Don Marme, which is the armed man, which was set by, I think it was set by Dufay, definitely by, Okay, so um, and Mon Marme was, as I said, it was, it was a popular, another popular tune around the time of the Renaissance, um, and, um, and that was often said. As late as Palace Trina, actually, he has a, uh, a, a composition titled Misa Mon um, Marme. So after the Council of Trent, these polytextual works effectively become man, a band. As a little side note, um, in the musical and liturgical world, we have lo uh, lots of debates about what the Council of Trent actually said about music. There's one line. And all the documentation from the Council of Trent about music, one line. Um, and it basically said, broadly speaking, it said that uh, nothing that is, or anything that is lascivious or frivolous should not be done in the music at all. So, uh, but what also kind of came out of that, and this, this, this ties into polytextual motets, because as, as you can imagine, polytextual motets got a little just frenetic, where you have literally one text, and I'll, sh I'll show this in a minute, one text might be. Um, a song like De Plus en Plus, which is a folk song in, in, uh, in northern France in the 14th century, and then you have a Kyrie being sung at the same time. And so it was a little, it was a little hectic. <laughs> and so that was another thing that the clarity of line started to be started to become something that composers were much more interested in after the Council of Trent. Um, so composers, in some some of them, some of it was admittedly rather boring. Composers like Vincenzo Ruffo, I'm judging by your reaction, no one's ever heard of him. Uh, was good for that. Uh, and he was he was he was obsessive about it, just complete clarity all the time, and as a result, he wrote music that was just kind of uninteresting. So <laughs> I'm not the only one with that opinion. Um, so so all that being said, the Cantus Firmus practice remains. So that that ties in in a big way to what we're going to talk about throughout the rest of the presentation about how composers used specifically the requiem mass chants in their music. Um, and it wasn't always as obvious uh, as what I'll show you in a moment. Um, but it was always, at least um, in the Renaissance, and it falls off a little bit in the classical and uh, romantic period, and then in the 20th century it comes back in, and composers were intentional about using that as their source material um, for, their, for their works. So here's a good example of what I mean when I say uh, Cantus Firmus. So this is Leonin and Periton. Um, this is just Leonin. Uh, they were two composers uh, from the Notre Dame School uh, in the 12th century, and it's the earliest um, they're kind of what we think of as our earliest composers. Um, obviously, music was being written uh, you know, for a millennium or for millennia before that, but that's the earliest, um, those are the earliest attributed, uh, personally attributed compositions that we have. So, in this recording, you'll hear uh, this is based on Viderum um, Omnes, which is a chant for um, it's a midnight mass, uh, or one of, the, one of the Christmas Eve masses or midnight mass. Um, and the tenor line. Is singing is singing uh, lines from the chant itself, and then the upper three voices, or in this case, it's just one other voice, is just kind of adorning that and doing ornamentations above it. Uh, in this case, the reason I bring this one up is because this one is very kind of one to one. He said, "Okay, here's here's the melody. I'm just going to set. I'm just going to kind of in very sort of paint by numbers style have this singer hold this note for a really long time, and then when I when I want him to move, he'll move. But it's 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 a little jarring. It's not the most pleasant to move. So here." Is this? <laughs> Okay. 
here's another example of the same kind of thing. And this is, so this is Dufay's, Guillaume Dufay's Numeros on Rosarum Flores. So this is another thing that was another characteristic of our pre-Tridentine musical world. This was a motet that you can't do in any liturgy ever again because it was written specifically for one liturgy. And so there are, there are lyrics in the, in the work that refer specific to this pope of that, the specific pope of this event and the specific day when it happened. Um, and so it doesn't really work at any modern liturgy or any liturgy other than this one. So it was written for the, for the dedication of the Duomo in Florence. Um, and, uh, and you see what he did here. So he's got Terribilis es Lobus Ise, um, which is just, it's a, it's a proper for the dedication of the church. So it's just terrible or great is this place. Um, and then he has his, so in the bottom two voices, he has this chant being sung. And in the top two voices, he has his text that he wrote himself being sung by the trellis. So here's a little bit of the chant. <laughs> And here's the motet. Very long and 
it's he, he makes his, he makes his best effort to keep it short uh, for the remainder of the work. So, uh, Cristobal de Morales, who is a Spanish composer, and Tomas Luis de Victoria, um, both very famous Spanish composers of their time. Morales has a four voice one and a five voice one. Um, his five voice one um, is the one that I have listed up there. It's performed all over Europe. It's very famous in Spain. It was also performed in South America. Um, uh, and then uh, Victoria has a four voice and a six voice. Victoria who was kind of uh, I don't know that he was a student of Morales, but he was heavily in influenced by Morales. Um, and this is getting to the Baroque and classic, classical periods. We have uh, Heinrich Schütz, um, who would have studied a lot with uh, northern Italian composers, particularly the Venetian school of composers. Um, so people like uh, Andrea Gabrielli, uh, Giovanni Gabrielli. Um, and he brought a lot of that style north to Germany with him. Um, but he has the first German language record, and of course, by this point, not have been done in the Catholic context. Um, Marc Antoine Chapontier um, in 1690. Uh, Zelenka was a Czech composer who wrote, and he has four requiems, one that is lost, I believe, uh, but the other three were written in the 1730s at some point. Um, he was sort of, he's not, not a composer you hear a lot about, but he was very famous in, in his day in Prague. Uh, and he was, he was very well known for if you were one of his singers or his players and you screwed something up in a performance, he would like run you out. So, um, uh, yeah, a different time. <laughs> and then Johann Christian Bach um, was one of the Bach sons. Um, so Bach's dates are um, seven, uh, 1685 to 1750. So uh, Johann Christian was clearly born a lot later in his life. He, so this, it's possible that it was misattributed to him. And that is just me saying that. I don't know if that's true. But I, 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 I found the record some, some years ago, and I haven't been able to find a score for it anyway. So, it could be that someone else wrote it. What's interesting about him is that he, um, J.C. Bach, 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 of course, had uh, 23 children. Um, and so <laughs> and so his, his sons, Carl Philip Emanuel Bach, Wilhelm Friedman Bach, uh, and Wilhelm Christian Bach, and there were a few others who, but those are kind of the three that we talk about, mainly in the musical community. Uh, Johann Christian uh, later went on to um, move first to Milan and then to London. He was called, we call him the English Bach. Uh, when he was in Milan, he converted to Catholicism, which is an interesting point because Bach probably would have been horrified, as in J.S. Bach would have been horrified had he had been alive to witness that. Um, and then, of course, we um, can't forget Mozart. Um, Mozart probably only wrote um, the uh, intro at Kyrie and then the Deep Sonata of the sequence, he and the rest of it he would not have completed. So there are sketches of the opera that we have, but most of, them were, uh, most of the rest of the work was completed by Franz Eber Zusmeyer. Um, a year after Mozart's death. Um, so, um, yeah. So this is where I get very general and historical, but I promise you it all ties in. So once we get to the 19th century, that's when we start to see, of course, we're coming out of the, the sort of, in the wake of the Industrial Revolution, we have the rise of the amateur. With the rise of the amateur comes um, the first ever volunteer, all volunteer choir, which would have been Mendelssohn's uh, Choral Society in town from London. So this is something that we, we, because we live in a world of, of professional choirs, of children's choirs, and many volunteer choirs, it was not usually that way. Up and so up until 1840, um, all of your choirs, ecclesiastical or concert choirs, whatever it was, would have been would have had boy sopranos and then eight professionals in the rest of the ensemble. So, um, so and also around this time, you do see the. Um, I don't want to say decline in quality, but the, the simplification of a lot of choral music, just because we hadn't yet come up with any sort of pedagogy to teach volunteers. So famously, Mendelssohn, I don't know if any of you are familiar with Bach's uh, B minor Mass. It's a very difficult piece of music. Uh, Mendelssohn spent six months teaching his choir just the curia in that mass. Just the first one, took six months to teach his volunteer choir. So no one really knew how to work with someone who um, was maybe in their 30s or 40s and didn't know how to read music or anything like that and, and try and teach them how to sing Bach. It was just, it was, musicians were always starting you know, three or four years old, and that was, that was who sang in church, that was who performed professionally. So, um, then you also have the moment like the, like the Oxford movement and the Church of England emerging in the 1830s. So this becomes the Anglo-Catholic movement. Um, and then much later, you know, after the, um, so prior, I have 1896 list about there. Prior to that, you would have had kind of the, rever the, the revival of the modest of the Abbey at Salem um, uh, in, in France.
cancer therapy team that done anything you want to say in that course of the day. They have nuns there as well. But so they the, the monks of Salem they compiled what's called the Hebrew Use Wallace, um, which basically still used to this day. And it has all of the liturgical chants, or almost all the liturgical chants, about the propers at least, that you would use at Mass and special days of the um, and in the divine office of special uh, special days throughout the year was compiled by the monks of Salem. So and important point here is that the the Gregorian chant performance and scholarship really after after the Middle Ages, uh, or what I'm calling the Middle Ages, so after like the 14th, 15th century, really starts to decline. And so you'll notice Mozart would, you know, he probably would have known some famous chant hymns, he probably would have known Ave Maria Stella, but would he have studied chant in school? Likely not. It was not something that was done very often. And so the monks at Salem were the ones who really revived. And what they did, um, the, if you've ever seen, I should have put some chant notation up on the, the screen. Um, if you've ever seen Gregorian chant notation that we use now, um, it was uh, that was a contrivance of the monks of Salem. So they kind of they cobbled together this <coughs> notational system um, from all of these various manuscripts that they found all over Europe, basically. Um, and so it's all kind of an approximation. It's all kind of what we think it sounds like. Um, uh, and it's it's a good approximation. And there are all kinds of there there are scholars who who they debate, you know, well, you know, in this manuscript, this little tick mark is longer than the other one, which means that you know this little short tick mark must have been a short note, this one must have been a long note because it took longer. I mean, it's like I mean that kind of stuff. <laughs> it's, um, and then after that, um, after that you have um, and this is a very important document um, in the church's history. Uh, these were sacred music is concerned. You have Pope Pius X um, uh, issues the most appropriate on sacred music, Carles Legitimi, or as I was Italian for among our concerns, basically. And um, so, where all of these things kind of tie in, uh, I have a bit of this kind of cultural breakdown in the wake of the Industrial Revolution. Um, uh, specifically, starting with the Oxford movement in the Church of England, people were looking around and seeing you know, culture and everything that way of lives just kind of disappearing from around them. And so what, which of course I'm generalizing, but the, that's essentially what was happening. And so what the Oxford movement kind of was, was it was a way of like, okay, we need to sort of get back to what we think the liturgy may have looked like, and we need to make the liturgy look more like that. And so things like, uh, I, think it was, I think it was 1828 was the first, it was, it was in the 1820s, that was the first year that uh, vernacular hymns would have been permitted to be sung in Anglican. Um, so, so which is which is an interesting thing, and that's probably something that the early members of the Oxford movement wouldn't have liked. And so, so, so Anglo-Catholic, if you ever this Grace and St. Peter's Church, which is downtown here, um, not too far from the Basilica, actually, that's an Anglo-Catholic church. And so, I've never actually been to the liturgy there, but um, they that, that's kind of the closest thing we have. Um, besides Mount Calvary, which was at one point an Anglo-Catholic church and now is an ordinary church, um, to what the Oxford movement kind of what they envisioned the mass looking like, which is very similar to traditional Latin mass, although a lot of it would have been done in English. Um, so, so what, what I, I guess what, what I'm getting at here, and this, and this and it ties into the monks at, uh, what the monks at Salem were doing, in that um, they were just kind of seeing all these all of these liturgical and cultural breakdowns around them. So this was kind of their way of like freezing things and solidifying them. And they said, okay, this is how we're going to do the mass. This is how we're going to sing chant. This is what the chant was supposed to sound like. A lot of assumptions were made, but it was kind of, they were just sort of grasping at straws because they had to. And Pius X said, hey guys, I want this book out. Can you do it? And they gave, you know, I think, I forget exactly what the date was, but they, he gave them like 18 months to compile this, you know, 1,200 page uh, tome on, uh, on, uh, on chant. So it's an impossible task, of course. So there are lots of things that were overlooked. Um, so, um, some of the things that were, that were discussed, um, or that sort of came out of the Salem Monastery and Pius X liturgical leaders, who have questions of the use of instruments in the liturgy, um, uh, specifically in the Requiem liturgy and also during Lent um, and Advent to a certain extent. Um, the approach to the singing of the Grand Chant. So the Salem Monastery, they kind of laid out how you know they thought chant ought to sound, and now we've got scholarship that suggests that they were right about everything, although they were right about quite a lot given the material that they were working with. Um, and then you have the Sicilian movement, which is happening before all of this, but this was kind of a 
reaction to um, it was a reaction to kind of what I was talking about earlier with the rise of the, the concert requiem, the, the rise of this continued divide between uh, sacred and secular, which of course had been taking place long before the, the Mexican Revolution, but it was you know, getting further and further solidified. And so, with with a piece like, for example, Handel's Messiah, which we all know, that would have been it's a sacred piece, but it was premiered in an opera house. And so, you're starting to see more of this kind of thing happening. And then, of course, you get to these concert requiems in the 19th century. So Berlioz's Requiem, um, which I believe all the one choral arts is doing this with, um, this massive, massive piece with like 15 offstage brass players and a huge orchestra. I mean, it's just this massive undertaking. Um, that was something that members of the Sicilian movement and then later on, I as kind of, kind of grimace at because they would say, well, that's, you know, that's, the most, that's the church's music. Why are you turning it into this, this you know, huge concert ordeal? Um, and you know, I sympathize with that to a degree, but for reasons I'll get into, I think they're wrong on that same thing. And then Verdi, his record, of course, comes along um, as a largely as, rea as a reaction to the death of Rossini, a very famous op uh, opera composer. Um, you know, Foray's Requiem, um, which uh, is written in the late 1880s, which actually would have been performed in, in the context of the liturgy. It is often done as a, as a concert requiem, but um, it was often done as a liturgy as well. Then I have also up there Brahms' um, uh, a German Requiem. So you see there, so you have a German Requiem, and then a German Requiem according to words, of, uh, or sung to words of Holy Scripture. And then you got, he also, he said, he, he commented, commented to a friend later in life that he would have liked to call it um, uh, a human Requiem, which is what the bottom line translates to. So where Brahms is concerned, and this is, you know, as this is an aside from the liturgical realm, he was what, what what a German requiem is is, is he, he he took um, a lot of words from the Psalms um, and then he just he compiled those and those were his text. So he didn't actually use any of the texts from the requiem. Yet. He just called it a requiem. And you you know it was it was a humanist requiem in his in his eyes. And that was kind of that was you know we're living you know post Beethoven at this at this point and Beethoven was Beethoven Goethe you know was, the art was it was this romantic humanist thing. And so they weren't necessarily concerned with. I mean, you know, Beethoven was religious in a sense, and Brahms would have been religious in a sense, but very much more in the kind of humanist late nineteenth century way. Um, Twentieth century requiems. Um, we have uh, Duraflay, which I'll talk, which we'll see a lot in the presentation, and then a few other requiems that aren't really requiems, kind of like Brahms. Um, uh, the, the Benjamin Britten War Requiem, a very famous piece. Um, he uses lots of text from the Requiem Mass and then lots of other poems as well that he just kind of interspersed in there. Um, and then Igor Stravinsky has his Requiem Canticles, which uh, relies more heavily on the text of the Requiem Mass, but he just kind of picked and chose which text he wanted to do. Um, and then uh, later, Krzysztof Andrzejewski uh, writes the Polish Requiem, which is kind of a reaction to the. Uh, um, is the Polish Revolution in 1970, if that's what happened in 1970. So, looking directly on that. Um, so, so anyways, what, what, what you see happen, and this happens in the 19th century and then into the 20th century, is kind of this, there's almost like a cult of the Requiem that kind of comes about in some ways. And it was, um, for example, as, as we'll talk about with some of these chants, the Die Sire, it's this, it's this like really kind of like bombastic emotional text about the day of wrath. Um, and the composers like Franz Liszt, um, and other composers, they they, uh, they they would take that tune. And for example, with Liszt, uh, who wrote a lot of piano music, he took the tune and, and um, laid it into his uh, um, Totenhaus, so his death hymn, Stands of the Dead. Um, uh, and uh, but it's it's almost like this kind of it's it's a little clownish at the very beginning. It's like this, it's in, and it's intended to be this sort of like bumbling death hymn, essentially. Uh, but he uses the melody from the Dies, from the Dies Irae for that. And so you see that. Uh, all the way to the, all the way to the 20th century, is a requiem. It's, it's sort of like like after Beethoven, no one wanted to write strings like that, just because they were like we we, we mastered it, we can't do it anymore. And so it was kind of this like badge of honor if you could write a string quartet that was almost as good as Beethoven, uh, which of course no one came close to. But um, and the requiem is it's, it's kind of a similar thing, especially after Mozart. It was like if you can write a requiem, then you're a real composer. So you know, I've been in the Parts, um, some parts of the mass here. So this is in Freud's text that translates to eternal rest before the Lord and I expect to light shine upon them. So just like our eternal rest prayer. Um, 
this verse and the spitting of God is saying, Him unto you on Mount Zion, etc., etc. Um, this is always, the intro always has a psalm verse, and then usually a glory of Patri or a glory of the Father, but the, the intro of the Requiem Mass does not have a glory of Patri. I don't know if there's a reason for that. I don't know if that's the way it is. So. Um, so then a few settings of this intro, I find some music here. Here's a chant version. <laughs>
So you see here it's like he, he sets a pretty little it's, it's very apparent. And this is it's not in all the movements of the piece, we'll listen to a few more of them. He doesn't do it quite as one-to-one -one, as literally as he does um, in this movement. He, he, often what he does is, he, you can kind of see it in this one a little bit, he uses it as sort of a point of departure. So we start off and it's very obvious, okay, here's the chant that we go. And then, for example, what he does in the, in, in the verse, so when the sopranos come in with the Tenedeja and Tunus and Zion, um, he changes the mode a little bit. So I actually, I want to show you this because I think it's cool. <laughs> Right here. Normally, the, the 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 way the mode works in this case, it would be. But he changes that because we were just in that uh, in in that mode. He changes it to. So he changes it a little bit. He changes with the half step to the whole step. It's 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 very intentional and it, um, it's 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 also artistically so. Shows that he says that to, okay, I've, I've made my statement here and now I'm going to mess with it a little bit while still keeping the general shape of the chant, I think. And then, of course, we have Herr Mozart. Now, before, before we do this, so Mozart, uh, you'll notice that there is almost no suggestion whatsoever of the chant. So by this point, um, he would, I mean, maybe he would have known the Requiem chant, I don't know, uh, but you really don't hear it. Very familiar with the text, you wouldn't hear it um, in his work. But there's one thing in the intro, I want to see if you can pick it out. Uh, when the verse comes in, when Tedesh and Moose, they listen to Zeal comes in. Necessarily, but with with um, with the verse, what I wanted to point out is he he's still you can tell that he's thinking almost in terms of, of the chant setting because when you sing when you sing these introits, usually whoever is doing it solos, and so that's and I don't know maybe someone has some musicological essay on this somewhere, but mm -hmm. just in my head I'm like well you know he knew that he was coming into the verse and so he gave it to a soloist and so it's a loose connection but it, it might be a might be a legit, legitimate one so. Um, and then we'll just listen to a little bit of the theory A, just because it's amazing.
stuff. But it's, a, it's such a great. The th uh, funny thing about this Kyrie um, Christe is that he breaks a little Tridentine rule, the unspoken Tridentine rule, and he has the Kyrie and Christe being sung at the same time. So the basses come in with the Kyrie, and then two bars later, the altos come in with the Christe. And that's just so scandal. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> this is good. Um, all right, so so I'll quickly go through uh, the rest of these parts of the record that I just wanted to touch on. So just to look at the the text of the sequence. So again, these these really these were hymns, these were poems. And you just look at this. I mean, it's really really extraordinary. So you have the Latin over here: Dies ira dies dies ira, sol vet secum fabila tesila di consula. That day of wrath, that dreadful day, shall heaven and earth and ashes lay as they. Or I must have made mine, and the approaching judge shall find and sift the deeds of all mankind. It's really, really heavy stuff. Um, uh, and um, I, so, so Mozart, you know, he would have said a little bit of, this, of the sequence. He would, so he has his DSUA, which I did not include in this. Um, just imagine being at mass in the late 1790s and hearing that for the first time, when, when death was so much more. Just a part of everyday life, and so much more interesting. I mean, it really it must have just been like this, this earth shattering experience. Uh, one thing, some of you might be familiar with the text of Kie Yezu. Uh, so that is the last little couplet um, of the sequence. So it's not it's not a separate movement. A lot of composers set it as a separate movement. Um, uh, but in the original Mass text, it is not. It's just the very ending. Here's a little bit of the, of the chant. So that is the one that is in the Roman Missal. Uh, many places still do it at mass. Originally, it is from the record of mass. And here's a, so this is it's, it's, this is a Manuel Cardoso. So this is later in the Renaissance, a Spanish composer. Here's his setting of the Santus. So I've isolated the, just the second soprano part, which is where the Cantus firmus lies in this case. Um, it's, you have to listen to uh, for it. It's not very obvious, but he uses it as rather than just being his melodic structure, it guides his harmonic structure. So it's kind of in the, the foundation a little bit, but it's not immediately visible. <laughs> Thank you. 
Spirit. Anyways, you get you get the idea. Can't skip it by accident, but um, so it's it's hidden in there, but it's still it's still used as his, as his uh, harmonic framework. So and here's Dura's latest song too, just for the record. It's the best one, but that's not. Thank you. 
side note, the documents of the Second Vatican Council don't explicitly say what they, you know, they mention, I would say, that the Sanctus should always be sung by the congregation. Now, I've seen plenty of people do this in the, do this piece in the context of the new mass, so clearly no one cares. But, or at least I don't, because it still works. It just, it is a little bit, it is a little bit awkward. So, Basilica, I'll do choral mass parts. Kyrie Gloria and the Agnus Dei, not usually for the Sanctus, mainly just because it's, at least in the old mass, the priest is doing something at that point, and everyone else is kneeling at the beginning of the Sanctus, rather than waiting until after you finish. So, it's a little awkward in the new way, so I understand why the direction is there. But I also applaud people who don't follow it, so. Those are meant to be both liturgical. And then with the little time I have left, here's just a little bit of the Agnus Dei. Thank you. 
just a little music theory there to note, he ends it on a dominant seventh chord, which a dominant seventh chord is always supposed to resolve to a tonic chord with the home key. So make whatever theological inference you want with this decision to do that. I think it just sounds cool, which is probably the real reason why he did it. But that's the presentation. Thank you all. Thank you. 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 Thank